Hoover, and I'm here in the Toyota Solution Studio. I'm here with a panel that just got off stage. We have an extraordinary group of women to talk about the reemergence of success in women in the political system in Rwanda. We have with us Ambassador Swanee Hunt, we have Minister Oda Gassingzigwa, and we have Ambassador Fatuma Nanziga. Thank you all three for being here. And congratulations. Congratulations on the names. This is, <laughs> you <laughs> all have done it. such <laughs> really remarkable work. And I think the headline out of this panel was 64% of elected positions in the national government in Rwanda are now held mm -hmm. by women. However, when, when the Constitution was drafted, the quota was at 30%. And what you've seen over time is that 64% of women are holding these positions. There's almost no need for a quota anymore. How did that happen? Well, the women were so smart. You see, in, in the, this society, women were not to speak when they were with men. And so, it, in terms of any decision making, it was such a patriarchal. It was absolutely. So that's why this exchange is so extraordinary. That's right, and the way they did it was to create women-only councils. So obviously, the women were speaking now. They were elected to those councils. And those were not. Those were at a local level. Very grassroots village. There were thousands of them in this tiny little country. And there were five tiers, so you ran for this level, then you ran for another, and you ran for another until you got to the very top. Now you would think that the women at the top would go over and fill the 30% of the seats that were set aside for women in the, uh, by the Constitution, but they didn't. Yeah. They didn't. The women below filled those seats, and the women who were the most experienced at the national level ran against the men. And once they did that, people saw how capable they were, how practical they were, how they worked across the lines, and that's, that was a huge story. So the local councils almost gave women at a local level a farm team of sorts. They gave them practice expressing their voice in a political realm. So they were then able to run against men at the national level. Uh, sure, sure, because uh, this was uh, this is a forum actually of today, which is um, helping organizing these women. And by the way, it's a constitutional institution. You know, uh, in our constitution, it is rightly clearly stated that we are going to be having a councils for women, and it is a women from the grassroots level. So these women sit together and look on the, on the challenges the country has and what is their role. How can they better contribute? And one of it is that you cannot be better contribute if you are not sitting on the decision-making position. And that is when by the quarter of 30%, after having this, then there is another opportunity of, of you know, going up and putting in place your program and uh, uh, with, the, with men, and, and the community comes in and select whom they want. Mm -hmm. And with this build commitment and confidence and trust from the, from the community, then women are now also taking over men in some of these posts. So at the end of the day, when they reach this, this 30%, which makes, actually makes 24, 24 seats out of 80 in the parliament. And then in addition to those who have managed to compete with men, then today we are at the 64%. Which is why you're at 64. It's such a nice story, sorry, go ahead. Maybe I can add one point. Uh, I think women were very strategic because the women councils that empowered women to speak up, to advocate for their rights, to learn how to lead came in place around 96 before the local councils yes. right from the village to the district level were organized where now they once they were prepared ahead of men now it was easy for them to go and compete with men so it means that women are not only confined to the women councils but they can also compete with men in other local councils so the 30 percent you are talking about is not only the, in the women's forums, but across the board. So this was also very strategic. Is there ever going to be a need to protect spaces <laughs> for men? <laughs> That's hilarious, I, because that question does come up. Like, have we ever in the history of the world thought that <laughs> that 64 percent of men was too much absolutely Forget not yeah right in the united states but it's like, 82 percent can you see this moving forward in a way though but where but, boys aren't taught to to lead because women are doing it i mean you could have is it possible that you could have a total reversal no no, no but, but what i think in rwanda the good thing is that um it, it, we, as we are promoting women we are not forgetting about boys is 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 a government uh, need to 
bring up everybody. But the women we had uh, concentrated for women because they were left behind. Yeah. But to have and really true gender equity is really what yes. Rwanda is, yes. but, is on uh, the path for. But yeah. uh, gender equity doesn't mean that you don't have you shouldn't have special programs for women. 100%. But now this time we are saying, and that's why there is, a, fa there is a, a department called family promotion to make sure that everybody, including boys yeah. and men, are not forgotten in the process. But yeah. you know, our men and brothers have been part of us, and I think that's the success of Rwanda. We never took a confrontation approach. We made men and boys allies. Yeah. So they feel empowerment of women is the empowerment of society, and yeah. at the end of the day, they benefit. Yeah, this is a family <laughs> thing. Yeah, this is a family thing. So in Rwanda, as she's saying, Ambassador Fatuma is saying, it's all about the community. It's all about what we need as Rwandans. So Rwandans are made of the family, a family of a man, a boy, a girl. And at that particular time, we are looking on what, where do we have a gap? So if we have a gap for women, then we come up with the programs for women. If we have a gap for, for boys, but now to make it more sustainable, we are focusing on education. Education for all is a policy which is promoting uh, boys and girls. So at the end of the day, as you are asking, citizens are going to sit to down and say, do we need this affirmative action or do we, do we have something more important to look at? But that is going to happen as we are moving with empowering both boys and girls to make them comfortable, to make them uh, having the confidence and capacities to lead and to, 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 to work and for the challenges our country is facing. So okay, do you want to pick that up? Because I also want to ask you about the violence. Okay, right. But when we talk about boys and girls are going to school, you have to put it in context. Mm -hmm. This was not done. Girls were staying home. They were doing the chores while the boys went to school. So this is revolutionary. You may even have a new generation of Rwandan women, mm -hmm. girls. 98% are in primary school. They yeah. won't have any recollection. But I think of maybe, the maybe the other thing to note is that as Sonny has said, you know, with gender inequality gaps, it's not only about women in participation. Now we talk about political participation. But you also have to think about women participating in business. Because you cannot talk about political power if you don't have economic power. Now, the focus is now to see more women becoming CEOs, more women taking over enterprises, not only small businesses of selling tomatoes, but you want women to fight for big tenders so that at the end of the day, you have women in academia at all levels. Mm -hmm. And the issue of education she talked about, we cannot say there will be affirmative action forever. We are telling women to sustain this. You have to learn to compete. Mm -hmm. And the only way to compete is to be educated, is to be the best that you can, so that you are everywhere and never be complacent. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Maybe if I can add a little bit, uh, uh, these programs to be more effective and more sustainable, now we have introduced uh, gender budgeting. Gender budgeting is a process whereby we look on uh, the resources we have in a country, but we look mostly on those, for example, we started with four sectors, agriculture, infrastructure, education, and health. These are very important sectors for women. So the country has owned this, and this is done, by the way, the Minister of Planning and finance and in those four sectors four programs with big budgets have to come up with four programs empowering women economically socially politically and making sure that this is a, is sustaining because it is not the issue of the minister of gender and family promotion to plan for this it is the whole process of the planning and budgeting and making sure that the resources we have the literal resources we have is empowering the special programs for promoting these women yeah and if i could just wrap up and yeah. say uh, two things after the genocide, there was still violence because the perpetrators, many had gone across the border and they would come back and they would do raids, killing and burning homes, etc. But they would stay in their homes to overnight. And the women in those homes, the mothers or wives, they would hear the men planning these and they would say, if you don't stop it, I'm going to have you arrested. Or they had them arrested. This was stunning. They were turning in their family members. So when I go to the parliament and I see the gender violence bill and how the women 
shaped that, the power of women, not just to stop the violence, but of the burnings, but also inside the home, they made sure that half the people on that bill were men. And I met the president of the Senate, and it's the last thing I'll say, mm -hmm. I love this. The president of the Senate said, hello, Ambassador Hunt, my name is Senator blah, 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 and I'm gender sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all for thank being you. here, and thank you for your leadership in Rwanda, all three of you. Thank it's an you. extraordinary example for the rest of the world in the thank development you. of women. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you.